I'm going to talk this evening about the mirror of life. Martinus tells us that uh, we live in a living universe, that everything around us is living beings. And uh, our exchange of energy with the surroundings is a kind of communication. And this communication is an exchange that is very logical and, in fact, also an expression of love. It's not always the way we experience life when it is unpleasant, but from this cosmic worldview, that is what we are learned. And uh, some people might wonder when they ask me how long I've been studying this teachings. And I say I started as 17 year old and I'm still reading the same books. <laughs> and they may, might think it's a little bit special. You just keep on reading the same books and you go to Klimt each summer and go to these lectures and teach around this topic. There are so many other books. Why don't you read all the others? I do too, but I do really have a focus on this literature. And uh, I think the reason why many of us keep on reading these books and are interested in this eternal word picture is that we might experience, is experience it as a kind of healing. For me, it has really been a healing to gradually start to know that this universe that I'm living in, this living universe, is a very friendly universe. I think we have all these old instincts within us that could experience life as a very hostile place. And there's a lot of fear and a lot of anger around in the culture or in this planet. And uh, it's kind of a natural way of relating to life when we've been living through the animal kingdom. And now we come to a teaching that tells us that that's a way of experiencing life, but we could look at it from another perspective, and we will see that it is really a caring, loving universe, even when it is unpleasant. And one of the aspects of this teaching is the law of karma that tells us that everything we send out to life, all our actions, they come back. And uh, they come back to make it possible for us to understand ourselves and the universe. When we get feedback, we grow. So even though it could be unpleasant, it is really something helping us growing in this evolution towards neighborly love. And the tool we are going to study today is the mirror of life, this dialogue with life through the law of karma. I don't know how you have it, but when you look in the mirror, the physical mirror, do you, are you very fond of what you see in the mirror, or are you sometimes a little bit frustrated or... If we just take that simple situation in everyday life, it's kind of a thing to really find this friendly look at yourself and maybe your aging and so on. And if we, that is just the physical mirror, <laughs> how about the mirror of the soul? But it is, as we said, a question of evolution. We are going through an evolution and if we stay here with the physical mirror, and we see a cat, sometimes it might be in conflict with the cat it sees in the mirror. It believes it is somebody else in the mirror. And maybe it starts to fight with its own image in the mirror. It is kind of a leap in the evolution when we start to realize that the dot on my nose is here, not there. And you could say 
that is really what we are learning through these teachings. Learn to start to realize that when we are blaming the world around us, we are blaming the mirror. And when we try to change the others, we're trying to change what's in the mirror, on the mirror, instead of what is being mirrored. So it's really a big leap in awareness of how life functions when we start to realize that what is mirrored around me, the actions towards me, and all the things I experience in life, it is showing me my own consciousness and in many ways also my unconscious sides. In many of the other unpleasant sides is showing me what we call the shadow, things that I don't, I'm not so fond of to see. And it is quite natural that we react and say, it's their fault. It's kind of an instinct. But uh, it is from this worldview, Martinez says that it is a perfect, absolute, profoundly meaningful mirroring in everyday life when we look at the mirror of karma. But it is very hard to really see in an objectively way, you could say. We have this tendency to have a distorted way of looking at ourselves in the mirror. If we go to an amusement park, there are often these mirrors that are kind of... And we think it's very funny, we're laughing at this distorted picture. Maybe we in the future will laugh at the way we saw at life and we had this distorted way of interpreting the speech of life. Matthias says that uh, the law of karma, where we as these eternal human beings, we sow and we reap, we have this dialogue in everyday life, he says that the law of karma is 100% correct. There are no coincidences in life. It's, it's a law of cause and effect. And uh, if we look at the gravitation, for instance, if I am not observing correctly, maybe I fall over a threshold. We don't say that uh, now the gravitation punished me and the stupid threshold was hitting me. We are kind of aware of that I did a mistake. I was not aware of where to put my steps forward. And it is kind of a natural situation that I fall. I can't blame the gravitation. But we have a tendency, and we have a history where we have been blaming the world, and maybe have experienced the law of karma as a kind of punishment. We are punished by karma and so on. But it is quite a neutral law, like the natural laws. It's the way we act that makes the reactions back. It's a mirror. And the mirror is not distorted. It's our interpretation of the mirror that is distorted. When we uh, are together with children, we know that it is not so easy for them to differentiate between their fantasy and the outer reality. So sometimes we hear fantastic stories about what they have experienced, and <clears throat> we can understand that it's quite natural for them to have this mix of their own fantasies, and sometimes maybe we hear things that you can wonder, is that from a past lifetime or is it from this lifetime? So it is kind of, the fantasy is telling a lot of stories from their inner world. So that was the children, but when we come to grown-ups, they know the difference between fantasy and reality, don't we? And uh, 
if we look around the world, we see that there are so many interpretations and so-called truths that are up on the surface of the consciousness of the, on this planet. So uh, we can hear the most fantastic views of life. Not so long ago I heard, for instance, that there was a big conference, an international conference, where they gathered from around the world with their hypothesis that the planet is not a globe, it is flat. And I thought it was a, a view of life that was passed a long time ago, but it was really a serious conference to show that it was kind of a conspiration theory that the globe, it was a globe. And also, there was a friend of ours where we lived up in Sweden who was talking to a person that was a member of the Nazi group. And uh, he also was very convinced that um, the Holocaust has never been... It was kind of a conspiration from CIA and other intelligence services that made this up. It was not true. And Hitler had not done these bad things. So when you're out on the internet today, you can also build up kind of a bubble of your own world and you go with those who have the same opinions and you really can be totally sure that this is the truth. So maybe this is a time in history where people really could build up their own true stories. And as we said before, usually we can it's easier to see how children can mix their fantasy with their rea outer reality. But as there are so many different views of life, it can't be true, all of these stories. There must be a reality that we have to wake up and be more aware of. So how come, why is it this way that we have so many different opinions and worldviews? Isn't it that way that we experience life through our senses and we photograph what we see and we have a correct picture, image of what's going on out there? No, we learn both in psychology and through Martinez's works that uh, we don't see with our eyes, we don't hear with our ears. We hear and see with our experiences. The experiences that we have gathered in this lifetime and in past lifetimes makes kind of a resonance within us when we get new impressions. And that's the reason why we experience life and are convinced that this is the truth. Let's just take an example from everyday life. If I say horse, I think it's easy for us to understand what is a horse. And we are convinced that we all know what a horse is. Of course, we know it from one perspective. There are four legs and there's a tail and so on. But if maybe some person in this room have grown up, maybe had a very tough uh, situation in the family and was very unsafe at home, but had a horse... And that was the safe place, being all free time with a horse, growing up with this horse as it's her or his best friend. And another person in this room have met a horse once, and that time it kicked that person in the back. So if I say, what's your image of a horse? We understand we will get two totally different inner experiences of the same outer object. And that's just an example how it is with everything we experience. It is related to our past experiences. And our understanding is growing with more and more experiences. It's getting more and more differentiated. And the nuances is growing when we become more and more, come closer to the object, so to say, learn to know it better and better. So, when we look in the mirror of karma, it does really have 
a lot to say uh, what we have, our interpretation is so decisive for what we experience when we get the karma. It is how we react on it, our reaction, our inner experience is so decisive for what we experience in this new situation. This symbol is called the eyes turning of the movement or the energy. And here we see the eternal eye, and we see also the capacity for creating and to experience. And this could also be interpreted as the created world, but also our sensory perception, how we experience life. Because the experiences or our thoughts are going through a process where it's very vague in the beginning, and it becomes more and more detailed, and we understand it more and more. And Martinez means when we really have gone through this process of understanding life in the, the different expressions of life, it will even be a feeling of gratefulness for what we have learned of this experience, even when it is unpleasant experiences. So if we compare it with a physical world, we know that if there is far away on the street, there is something moving, we just see a little dot, is very far out in the periphery of our sensor, uh, <coughs> sense, uh, perception. And <coughs> then we only have a vague, instinctive, experience of it, and that means also that it is totally free for our projection. Is it a man, or is it a rabbit, or is it a somebody on the bike? Our fantasy can project on this vague sensation we see in the periphery of our physical surroundings. And it's the same thing if some experience in life is totally new. We don't have any experience within us to relate to this object that is coming closer to us, or this phenomena in life. Then it is also filled with our fantasies and projections. So maybe indigenous people in Africa, the first time they saw an airplane coming, they had to relate to their experience of birds, for instance, they couldn't understand what was coming flying. They thought, that's a very big, special bird coming. We have to relate to the experiences we have, and when it's new, it is filled with our experiences of other things that we project. And uh, when we are here out in the periphery with new experiences, it is unknown, so to say. The unknown is often also from the self-preservation. We react with fear or hostile feelings towards things we don't understand. And that is part of our, you could say, the animal reaction. But usually when we come closer and closer, we get to learn, for instance, a person more and more, we can start to feel empathy and maybe later intelligence we can understand let us take an example from everyday life. Maybe we, on our working place, have had a new colleague, and in the beginning there was something triggering me. I become irritated and thought it was a disturbing person in this situation in my working place. But then maybe we start to eat together and we have a dialogue, and that person starts to open up and tell their life story. And when we understand that person, their background usually this irritation kind of uh, disappears. So that's kind of a process where when our, we can get more experience also emotionally and with our intelligence, we start to understand the object. And as we said, in everyday life situations, also the first imp uh, unpleasant experiences when they are, we could say we have been working with them and understand them better, they will also give a feeling of meaning, purpose. And when we see the purpose and meaning with things, usually we can also become more and more grateful. So it's really a process of getting 
learning to know life in its different details. And all of us have areas where we have a more primitive reaction because we don't know so much about it. And uh, other situations, somebody's waving in the interpreter. <coughs> Is something wrong with it? Okay. Of course, the way we interpret the things coming towards us in life depends on our sensory perception. And we know that if we are in a group, one person can react very aggressively at one thing, people say. And the other person thinks it was very inspiring, and so on. So it's always a personal reaction, and that is a very important part of what we experience in life, and that means also a part of our karma, so to say. There was, uh, many years ago, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, there was this big debate in Sweden about uh, the possibility to use uh, this test of the embryonic fluid in the womb uh, to see if it was a retarded child that was going to be born. And it was very controversial. And uh, they put it out as a debate in the society, and uh, the government sent out questions to people that were working with uh, the children and parents and other people in the society. And uh, it was very interesting to see that the persons who had, there as were parents to retarded children, they did not want this test to be practiced in society. The people that was working with the, they were working with these children, they did not want the test to be practiced. But the people that didn't know anything about these children, they wanted it. And I think that's an example of when you learn, learn to come close to things and hear maybe experience that you are growing as a person in these different challenges that it is, of course is to have retarded children, but you can feel the affection to them and so on, then you feel that they have the, their right to live as everybody else. But if you don't have the contact, it's kind of something that is very foreign, it's out in your periphery, and usually react with kind of a... <coughs> you repel what is unknown to you. So in this time of... Uh, we talk about fake news, and we have all these different uh, dialogues of what is true. It's, of course, interesting to see, can we find a way to distinguish between what is true and what is not true? And uh, one way that Martinus talks about this is from this text that I will read here, from Leavitt's Bow, number four. Number four. He says, this falsehood in the individual's manifestation of thoughts thus consists not merely of what is expressed by the familiar concept of a lie, <clears throat> but is in reality identical to everything that comes under the concept of primitivity, imperfection, and naivety, everything that comes under the concept of evil, persecution, slander, anger, revenge, indignation, or, in brief, everything that expresses unkindness or inhumanity cannot possibly appear in any way other than as a limited or inadequate expression of the entirety of the cycle and thereby of life. So I think it's a very interesting way of looking at this, what is the truth, because the real truth of life and our dialogue with life is telling, in, telling us that there is always a purpose with everything we experience. And there is always a loving purpose, even with the unpleasant experiences we get. It's the least darkness to lift us up to a higher step of evolution. It's the least pain we need just to grow as a human being. 
So as long as we are condemning anything or feel anger or fear, we haven't reached the true state of understanding this phenomena as a dialogue with the Godhead, a caring dialogue with the Godhead. When we condemn or judge others in a negative way, it is telling more about ourselves than about that person. It's revealing the step of evolution, maybe the lack of experiences we have to be able to really understand that person or that phenomena in society or in politics or whatever. Because everything has its role in this evolution and everything is an expression of different steps of consciousness. In that sense, nothing is wrong. Everything's our steps on, evol on the evolution. And when we really see it in the, with a bigger perspective, we can kind of forgive life, the world, ourselves and the others. So as long as there is hostility, there is uh, <clears throat> some anger, intolerance, we are not in contact with the real purpose and the real truth of this aspect of life. And we also have this expression that the way we judge others, we judge ourselves. In psychology, we often talk about uh, that what irritates us in others are things we dislike in ourselves. So it could be a very good tool to learn to know about yourself instead of just keeping on say, say that they are so irritating to experience, to look at the dot here on the nose and start to look at yourself. When I'm irritated, there's something unfinished within me that I can look at and do something with it. And it's also a vicious circle because as long as we condemn the others, we are also afraid of realizing that we have the same personality aspect of ourselves. So it also stimulates the fear, the anxiety within us when we are intolerant and condemning towards others. But it is quite natural, it couldn't be otherwise, because we are here in the step of evolution with this, you could say, limited way of experiencing life and the truth of life and the purpose of life. So if we ask the question, why do we believe that the speech of life is wrong or that our fate is unjust? You could say that the very... So the, the biggest, uh, greatest answer at this question is that it is an evolutionary process. We grow of our experiences and gradually we will start to understand the speech of life and we will understand that it's not a divine blunder that we have these different, uh, or struck by a different an illness or a conflict or a divorce or whatever it is. It is a part of this education process. So it's a gradual process, but let us also look at some of the colored glasses that kind of distort the way we experience life or look at our fate in everyday life. We don't have these really clear glasses. In a way, you could say it's first when we have this cosmic consciousness. So one of the examples of this that is very easy for us to see, I think, is when we see this amorous love versus neighborly love. I think it's an interesting expression in English, we fall in love. <laughs> you kind of fall. <laughs> and uh, we know in this uh, amorous love, we have a distorted picture of the other person. So maybe if a friend of you really fall in love in somebody you know, and they tell about that person, you, hmm, that's not the person I know. <laughs> Looks wonderful when you tell that story, but maybe I have some other experiences. And uh, maybe when we meet the same person some months or some years later, they also tell another story and the shadows, so to say, have been revealed. And this uh, very 
idealized picture of the other one has fallen and maybe gone over to the contrast for a while when you only see the bad sides, so to say. And that is really an example of these colored glasses that we also can train to look through, to be aware of, okay, now I am in that state of mind. And uh, sometimes we say in Sweden that if you fall in love, it is kind of an illness. You have to have a sick leave <laughs> because you are not really aware <laughs> of what you are doing. And sometimes you take some decisions that you will not be so fond of some years later. So it's good to kind of take the decisions later when you are aware again about the totality of the person, so to say. Another example of these uh, color glasses is arrogance versus humility. Because uh, arrogance, then we kind of, we think we are so much better, we know so much better than we really do. And uh, we don't really listen to the law of karma or to other beings because we already know it all. So humbleness or humility, that is another way of relating to life where you know that this is unfinished, this is an unfinished side of me and this is maybe even a perfect side in me. You could see the good things, you could see the bad things within you, but your identification as a much deeper and higher aspect, connect with another aspect of the eternal core, so to say, in another way. So criticism and things of your fate that is maybe unpleasant, it doesn't kind of disturb your image of yourself. It's part of the dialogue where you maybe also become grateful for the feedback that life gives you, or a friend gives you this feedback. You don't have to defend yourself because you know about these different sides. And when it comes to neighborly love, it's also a way of seeing the other person where you don't weigh them up and down, so to say, relating to what they do that are pleasant or unpleasant. You have a love behind all these outer actions, something that is connected with the deeper aspect of that person, and you can handle the situations without coming out of balance. So let us go back to the law of karma and see we have this individual way of interpreting it, but let us see at the law of karma why it is good for us to learn more about it, to really understand the way it works in everyday life and what we can learn from our daily life. It is thus evident here that our life is exclusively the experience of our surroundings or fellow beings' reflection of the mental energy that we send out to them in the form of the satisfying of our highly different normal and abnormal desires. This reflection of the forms of energy or thought that we ourselves release is our fate. The reaction of our fellow beings to us is the mirror of life. In this reaction we see our real spiritual experience, our true cosmic analysis or the absolute truth about ourselves. And I think it's interesting to see here in the text, he talks about the forms of energy or the forms of thought. Because often we are so busy with looking at the outer appearance of our karma. But he talks about the energy behind, the thought energy behind, or the thought form. And here we can also see how important it is when we are interpreting the speech of life, to have the eternal word picture that is really widening our understanding of this dialogue. 
We, it is very important to learn that it is a living universe and that these organs we have within us, these cells we have within us, they are also our neighbor, our fellow beings that we are here to learn to love. And also the macro being. For instance, what we sow towards our micro beings is something we can reap from the macro being. So if we do a lot of things that is very harsh on our microcosmos, like smoking and drinking a lot of alcohol or whatever, there is really a big pollution going on in the, for the micro beings. They have a very tough time. And that means also that it's connected with where we live within the macro being. It is, we, we reap what we have sown towards microcosmos in the way we where we incarnate, where we live. If we come into a very polluted area, it's also a reaction from the actions of pollution that we have sown towards our micro, micro beings. And another very important uh, aspect of the eternal word picture that Martinez shows us that is important to, to be able to understand our karma is also our connection with the animals. He says it is a very intimate karmic relation between us and the animals. The way we act towards the animals is also something that will be acted on on our body, in our fate. And the animals, they have emotions, they can have anxiety, they have fear, and they also have their self-preservation, want to live. So when we shorten their life in these factories for farming and for slaughterhouse and so on, then we are also creating a fate that we see a lot of on this planet. And here we come back to the text and see when Martinez talk about it is the thought form, it is the thought energy that comes back. Then it's easier to see when he tells about the connection with our relation to animals, when he says that meat eating and slaughter of animals is connected with the fate of accidents, of natural catastrophes and drowning and so on. Because uh, when, you, when you kill an animal in this slaughterhouse, it's not because you have a personal hatred toward that pig. I hate you pig, I'm going to strangle you. That's not the energy. It is just like a machine killing that body. And it's the same thing with an accident. Or if there's a bomb that falls into Syria and people are killed. That's also just killing like the slaughterhouse. And as Leo Tolstoy said, as long as there are slaughterhouse, there will be slaughter fields. So that is really a cosmic truth. And that's also why we can sometimes see that people that are very, very humane, they can also have this very tough karma with accidents or being molested. And we also think there are connections with violence, with rape, with imprisonment that is not just and so on, because that is what the animals are experiencing in this time. So that's also a very important knowledge to really understand the fate that many people have today also in areas like Syria, for example, where so many people are drawn into war, maybe very humane and uh, uh, gifted people that come into these tough situations. So it is the thought form that comes back. So we can kind of train to not only see on the outer physical form, but see what is the energy behind it. It's the same thing, for instance, with dominance. Maybe you say that my boss is so unpleasant with his dominance and he's deciding a lot of things just above our heads and so on. He doesn't care about us. And uh, maybe you say that I would never be able to do, handle people in that way. And then what is the thought from this dominance and this lack of listening to other beings? Is there somewhere else in my life that I act like that? 
maybe not in the work, but maybe towards my spouse at home or my children and so on, or my dog. Or <laughs> it's the energy I send out that comes back. It doesn't have to be the same outer form. So the real protection is a question of my own humane development. When I come to a level of compassion that, I, that makes it impossible for me to act in that way, then there would be a release in my karma, so to say. Martinus has this symbol here that is called the forgiveness of sin. Sins. And I would just want to say there first that Martinus says there is no sin. But there are ignorance. There are things we don't know enough about. We have a lack of experience. And that's why we do these unpleasant and evil things. But he relates to the old sayings about the sins and the forgiveness of sins. And he shows us here that, that here we have this incarnation, this physical body. And we have reincarnation, coming life, and so on. And here it shows that if this person is killing somebody, if it comes back here in the same lifetime, we have not developed the compassion, our compassion and your, our humane capacity enough to be protected. But if we have grown in this, you see the yellow flame here, this humane capacity even further in the next lifetime, this killing energy will be not so strong. Maybe we will have this fight or somebody we will not be killed because we have learned the lesson not to kill. And if it keeps on like this further in the future and while humane capacity have grown even further, then maybe it's just some harassment in the school when we are children and so on. And when we come all the way up here, we see that the growth of our own humaneness, our compassion, will stop and be the real protection towards this dark fate. That is also a way really to show that karma is, has nothing to do with punishment. As soon as we have learned the lesson, it will fade away. And Martinus describes this in this text, it can experience the consequences or the eff effects of its evil actions only as long as it continues to manifest them. When a being being's humaneness has become so developed that it no longer has the heart to manifest one evil action or another, then it becomes Im immune to the consequences of former evil actions no matter how many of these have been committed and the effects of which still have not returned. So that is really, you could say, a, a loving aspect of karma. When we learn the lesson, it fades away and we have the real protection. But it is really when it is in our heart. It's not enough with just have a theoretical understanding of the law of karma it has a quest it's a question of do we have enough experiences that it makes it possible for us to have compassion with the other beings or the animals and so on so that we can be protected by our own humaneness and uh, there is another aspect of karma that is also interesting that comes back to this first aspect of our lecture today about our sensory perception. How do we perceive what's going on? He says, as one sows, so one reaps. All manifestations or actions return sooner or later to their source and trigger retribution. And one's fate will continue triggering this situation until one can no longer be offended and can no longer hate or take revenge. But one forgives one's enemies again and again. So that's also an interesting aspect when it comes to the way 
we react on what's going on. And I think there are areas in life where we, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, when a thing, a situa- we were in the situation, we could be very offended and irritated at the th- person doing this. But today, maybe the, thing, the same thing happens, but we don't have any irritation. We can just take it as it is, and it kind of just falls away. It doesn't bother us anymore. So that's also an aspect of release of these old reactions that is very important to have, you could say, your aura (laughs) intact. It's like as long as we are very irritated or hate things that are going on, then it's kind of a dark spot in our aura. And the forgiveness is the way to heal our aura and also gives a protection that make us experience life more and more as a friendly place to be in. So as long as we encounter different actions as an aggressive attack from a hostile universe, then we are still kind of hooked in these old patterns. So the more we learn that this, the purpose of all our karma is really friendly, it's a way of helping us, and it is a growth possibility, so to say, then it's easier to also handle a situation that maybe before was very tough for us. So looking at karma as a way that the universe is helping us further in evolution, it will help us to reconcile with life, with ourselves and others, and it will be much easier to listen to the message instead of being disturbed by the messenger. So the solution of our path towards light is, as we know from Martinus' works, forgiveness. And he shows it very clearly with this symbol that turning the other cheek, that is not the physical cheek, that is the humane side of us, to react in a humane way towards the unpleasant, that is the real relief from our bad fate. But let us look at how we can work with this law of karma, this mirror in everyday life. And it's, think, I think, interesting to see that there are two aspects of this, as we have seen in the lecture so far. It is to understand what's mirrored within oneself. What happens is telling me a story of something in my own consciousness to work with. And the other aspect is to learn to react in a loving and wise manner, to turn the humane side towards the situation. There's also talents, how to react, that we have to build up, so to say, and train. And uh, here I will also summarize the process, so to say, or how to, in a how we can, in a constructive way, relate to the karma, the mirror that we see in everyday life. And the first aspect to remind us of is to accept the negative emotion, thought, or action. If we are going to see life as it is and get rid of these all distortions, it's really a question of accepting it just as it is. If I really accept my unfinished sides, it's much easier to do a good job with them. If I try to suppress them or I don't want to see them and I hate them, it's much harder to do a good job to release these old patterns and build up new ones. And it's the same thing when we look into the mirror, if we can accept it, okay, this is happening now, I have this conflict and so on, to find a kind of an acceptance of it. That is absolutely the basic first step. And the next, as we've been talking about, is to look in the mirror, both what I encounter and my reaction to it is something I create. Because the old pattern we have from the animal kingdom is it's the other's fault. And they have to change. Then I will be happy. 
But here we say, okay, I have created this situation in my fate. And I react out of my talents. And that is the most uh, liberating way of relating to life. When you see that it comes from within, then we really have a possibility to do something. If we are only victims for the world around us, we cannot change it. We cannot change the world, but we can change our way of reacting towards the world and acting to the world. So we get the power back. And that is a very, very important step to feel good in life when you feel, okay, I, can, uh, I have an influence of my life and my future. And we know it's not so easy to understand why do we have this faith? Why does it ha this happen? But you can have some questions that you can meditate on when you are in a tough situation, for instance, like this. The question can be, what is the essence of what the other person does that disturbs disturb me? What is the thought form? What is the thought energy to focus on the energy behind and not the outer appearance. And then the next question can be, how can experience, who can experience something I do in a similar unpleasant way, if it's some unpleasant things I want to work with, and be creative in finding different situations, relations. And sometimes when you meditate on that, there will pop up a situation, a memory of something you have done towards a person or an animal or the nature or whatever that you see a connection with. And the next step in the process is to be aware of your goal. You have to be aware of the direction. Where are you heading? I mean, everything in life has a direction. Our body has a direction. Going upwards, for instance, the trees does too. Thanks to the gravity, we have this direction upwards. And everything in life is on a path towards something, has its longing. And when we have some actions or thoughts, climates we are not so fond of, it's very important to find out what do I want to create? What, which reaction do I want to have to this? And so on. And uh, to have this goal gives me a direction, and then it's so important to accept the gap between the ideal and the capacity I have today. Because if I want to be a Christ being on Sunday, I would be a little bit burdened this week. But if it is, I have some thousand years, <laughs> and I get some good examples in everyday life that could inspire me in this process, I see it as an organic evolution, then I have my direction, I go that path, and I can be in this mirroring in everyday life and work on it. So it's very important to see it as it's a path that I begin when I have this goal, but it's very important to have a goal, a direction in your life. It's also a big help to Think about where have I, early in my life, been in a similar situation and see how I handled it that time. But very, very important also to be open-minded and have the dialogue with your fellow beings. Because we know from so many self-help groups, so to say, that uh, when people open up and listen to the other ones that have similar experiences, there's so much to learn. And it's also such a big relief to realize that I'm not alone in this, these problems. So to listen, to have a dialogue with friends or groups or that are connected with these similar, similar problems are so a big help on this path towards a new way of living and experiencing life. And then uh, the last point here today is how important it is with this contact with God. And when we connect that with our practical training, if we, for instance, feel a lot of intolerance or it's hard for us to forgive a person, to really ask for help, because on the other side here, there are so many 
light beings that really wants to help us. So when we open up and are also open for that it's not only people in the physical realm, it's also in the spiritual realm that really wants to help us and ask for this help, we will more and more experience that we get inspiration, we get impulses that can help us on the, on the road towards a new behavior or new reactions. And of course, it's a question of practical training in everyday life to try to practice tolerance, humaneness, humility, and uh, being helpful and serving, so to say, nature or whatever. This practical training builds up these talents that creates a new world. So the real human kingdom is nothing we do wait for and sit and say, oh, it's 3,000 3, years I will come into the real human kingdom. No, it's something we build up every day when we are training practically to be connected with the divine aspect of life and to practice neighborly love in everyday life. Thank you for today. <clears throat>